So good evening, everyone. I think I'm supposed to go ahead. I don't know that I have a specific cue yet, but I think I will just go ahead. So uh, welcome, I'm Lynn Erickson, the Executive Director and CEO at the Da Vinci Science. I'm thrilled that so many have joined us tonight. My only regrets are that I can't look out into the audience and see each of you, nor were we able to sit and chat over dinner in the trad traditional sense. Such are the limitations of virtual gatherings. That said, I hope that all of you are finding our virtual Remo world as interesting to visit as I am. We hosted our first WISE Forum in 2014 that eight years later, we would be meeting in a virtual event space. I would have been more than a little skeptical. But thanks to technology, here we are. The last 18 months have really underscored the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM and the significant role of women in STEM in all aspects of society has also become more prominent. Of course, we all know that already, I'm preaching to the choir, but that's why we're here tonight. But before I go any further, um, this, uh, at this event and I dare say the entire WISE initiative, actually before I go any further, I want to remind you that audience members can click the full screen button in the upper left-hand corner or excuse me, upper right-hand corner, if you wanna make your screen larger. So there's a full screen button, so feel free to click on that. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do right now is thank our sponsors. This event would not be possible without them. Thanks to their generosity, we were able to shift gears and go virtual, which allowed us to increase the number of students who could attend. Our legacy sponsor is Sanofi, a generous supporter of this event since the beginning. Our presenting sponsors are ATAS International and B. Braun, both also longtime supporters of the Science Center. Heartfelt thanks to both our legacy and presenting sponsors. I also want to thank all our partner sponsors, and I'm proud to say also all long-term supporters of the Science Center. Air Products, Highmark Blue Shield, and PPL Corporation. And last but not least, thank you to all our supporting sponsors and networking sponsors listed here and in the electronic program book that you can download from our website. The WISE initiative has three primary goals, to direct young girls who are interested in STEM, to connect professional women employed in STEM fields, creating a community of STEM professionals who support one another, through networking, social events, and mentoring, and to bring passion, insight, expertise, and resources to advise the Da Vinci Science Center on strategies for developing girls' interest and achievement in STEM. The WISE Initiative is led by the WISE Advisory Council, many of whom are, are here this evening. These ladies are busy reimagining the future of the WISE Initiative. I won't give anything away, but I will tell you that they're developing plans for a variety of programs and resources that will be available in the coming months. Thank you, ladies, for all your dedicated time and expertise. Before I turn the night over to our esteemed panel, I would like to welcome Dr. Tamala Mallet moore from our legacy sponsor, Sanofi, to say a few words. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Tamala Mallet moore a therapeutic area head in the pharmacovigilance department for flu, meningitis, pneumonia, and COVID-19 vaccine development at Sanofi. Pharmacovigilance is the science and activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention of adverse effects from any medications or vaccines Every day I get to go to work and I get to analyze clinical trials for human patient safety. I look for clues to understand the product profile of the vaccines and drugs in development. And for me, it's like putting together a giant puzzle every day. And I'm passionate about preventing illness and saving lives, especially in light of the current pandemic. On behalf of Santa Fe, I'm not only thrilled to be here, but I'm proud to be part of an organization that supports girls 
interested in science and is committed to helping women in science advance in their careers. It is fitting that Santa Fe would be a legacy sponsor of the Da Vinci Center Women in Science and Engineering Forum, supporting this forum since its inception in 2014, because Santa Fe as a company is a strong supporter of women in STEM. Coincidentally, we also have a WISE employee resource group at Santa Fe, only R stands for Women Inspiring Santa Fe Excellence. All the women involved come from a diverse cross-section of STEM careers across the organization, and it is the strongest employee resource group at Santa Fe. Some of you may know Dr. Pat Petrovan, who is in the WISE Forum Liaison at Da Vinci Science Center and a leading member of the team who put tonight's event together. Before she retired from her role as the Associate Vice President of Research and Development, Pat and I worked together at Santa Fe. We were both actively engaged in the company's WISE program. And while we were both in leadership roles, Pat became a mentor to me in many ways in my career. And what I've learned from her, I pass on to other women in the company and through the Da Vinci Science Center's WISE initiative. I am proud to be a member of the WISE Advisory Council and look forward to being part of this group as it continues to grow. What started out as a program to engage younger girls in STEM has grown into an opportunity for STEM professionals to mentor college and high school students, show them how to network in person and to use online tools like LinkedIn, while at the same time be, being part of a pro powerful networking group. There are many organizations that speak to diversity and inclusion. I am proud to be a part of a company culture where the richness of our diversity is highlighted through employee resource groups like WISE, where women can enhance their professional career development. Santa Fe's support of the WISE Forum underscores its dedication to the next generation of women in STEM. And I'm very proud to be um, a member of both um, the WISE Forum um, at the Da Vinci Center, as well as the WISE Employee Resource Group at Santa Fe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamala. It is wonderful to hear you talk about how mentorship is an ongoing part of your professional journey. And I agree, Pat is a tremendous role model. Speaking of role models, I hope that everyone had the opportunity to read about the women you're going to hear from this evening. I, for one, can't wait and feel humbled that they have taken time out of their busy lives to be with us. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel member who will also be this evening's moderator, Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Julie Louise Gerberding. Dr. Gerberding is the Chief Patient Officer and Executive Vice President at Merck where she is responsible for global public policy, patient engagement, advocacy, strategic communications, population health, and corporate responsibility. She joined Merck in 2010 as president of Merck Vaccines. Dr. Gerberding was the director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which we've been hearing a lot about over the last year and a half, especially CDC from 2002 to 2009 where she led the agency through more than 40 emergency responses to public health crises. Dr. Gerberding has received more than 50 awards and honors, including the United States Department of Health and Human Services Distinguished Service Award for her leadership in responses to anthrax bioterrorism and the September 11th, 2001 attacks. You can read more about her on our website. I am thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Gerberding. Thank you, Lynn. And I just have to say that I raced across Washington, D.C. tonight to be here for this conversation. And I'm so sorry I was not able to join the earlier mentoring conversations because what this is about is just incredibly near and dear to my heart. So thank you all for joining us. And I am particularly honored to be a, a moderator of such incredible women. And I do hope you've read their bios, so I'm not going to go into their um, biographies in detail, but just let me say I'm just honored and I hope you feel as inspired and as motivated as I do by their um, their histories and their, 
their backgrounds, but also I think the comments that they'll have tonight. So I'm just going to jump right in here because I don't think we need to spend a lot of time with formalities. And Jay, I'm going to start with you. Jay Gardner is a PhD postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Fox Chase Cancer Center, which is right in my neighborhood. Actually, I'm a Philadelphian. Um, and she's also an if then ambassador. And, and Jay, just to kind of kick things off, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about, you know, what do you love about your job in research? And, you know, why do you get up in the morning and, and go there with such enthusiasm? It might be a little bit cliche. And also, hi, everyone. I'm glad that all of you are here. Um, but one of the things that gets me up in the morning is that I really love answering and figuring out puzzles. And that might seem super cliche, but when I was a kid, I loved reading mystery books and trying to figure out who did it before I got to the end of the book. I love doing puzzles and figuring things out. And there is no bigger puzzle than figuring out how life works. And science is just the way, and research is the way that I can try and figure out answers to those puzzles. So. I absolutely love it. I, It's hard, it's very challenging, but I like the challenge. And I also love the flexibility that I have with, with my schedule that I, you know, if I need to take a day to just really read what other people have done and trying to put those puzzle pieces together as opposed to being physically in the lab and trying out my own experiments, I can do that. And so th those are probably the two things that I love the most about my job. Thank you for that. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that from Elsa, who's going to maybe talk with us about, um, did you know from the time you were little that you were going to be a chemical engineer and end up in a very prestigious academic role, teaching others, but also doing your own research? Did Is that had early roots no. or something? So I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna say no, I, I didn't know that when I was, really little. Um, I think what inspired me was a high school chemistry teacher um, that, you know, she was excellent and really turned me on a chemistry. And so while I'm in a chemical engineering department now and active in research in chemical engineering, my degrees are actually in chemistry. But then when I got my first professional degree, you know, I really wanted to do something that was more applications oriented and driven towards, you know, providing, you know, in some sense, you know, a product that could benefit society. And, and that led me into research related to sort of the, the chemistry and the materials processing associated with integrated circuit manufacturing, uh, which all of us are relying on today, particularly for this event right now. Um, and ultimately that drew me into being interested in mentoring younger professionals, interacting with students um, and seeing them grow into, you know, what they want to be when they graduate and they enter their professional careers. And so that kind of led me into academia. Um, and, and so, you know, now I'm at Lehigh University uh, in the chemical engineering department and really actively involved in working with undergrads and graduate students helping them be successful and helping them achieve their career goals. And you know, that's what I really enjoy. So I, I love Jay talked about kind of the puzzle and the, the joy and the curiosity that goes into puzzle solving. You're kind of talking about your sense of purpose and how that really motivated. Yeah, and, yep. And, and the two kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah, you know, I suspect the research that Jay is doing is also yeah. really has a sense of purpose. And, and just, just for our audience, let me, let me just say that purpose is something that, you know, when you work in an organization, people often talk about your mission and your strategy and your goals and your objectives. But the thing that gets people up in the morning and motivates them to come to work and 
find deep pleasure and satisfaction in the work is that internal purpose, the, the feeling that what they are doing is really part of a greater good or something that is really making a contribution either to individuals, to students, or you know more broadly to society, or even in the broadest sense to global health. So you know, we, we, we all have a, a kernel of that, and it's something we don't always talk about overtly, but it's a really important thing for people to think about, like, what, what, what is my passion? What, what is my, my real sense of purpose in life? So with that, let me turn to Annette because she has a job that I don't know much about. Um, you know, forensic engineering is, those are two words that I actually never heard adjacent to each other until I was reading a little bit about you, Annette. So you have a fascinating um, career in, in, in a discipline. So tell us about that and, and how you ended up in that field. Um, certainly. Um... Well, I'll try to do my best to explain forensic engineering. Um, uh, I guess by definition, forensics is the use of science and technology to investigate and establish facts. So in forensic engineering, we use our anal analytical knowledge of the behavior of structures to try and determine why certain components or elements or materials fail. So once I get when I get involved in a forensic project, like we might need to review the other engineers design calcs to see how they how they did things if they did anything wrong. We'll review the project documents and the drawings. There'll be like a whole document discovery. Um, we review the opposing sides expert report to see if there's any holes in their analysis. Um, we review testimony of key players in the project. And then if it is like there can be smaller failures where it's just a component of something and there can be large scale, which, you know, we saw in Florida with the collapse of the buildings. Um, and if there is a collapse, we might be asked to go out and document and survey the site of the collapse. We might have to bring back some sample materials that will be tested in a lab to determine if like the material strengths are what the original designer anticipated because the failure can be in many different components of the entire project. Um, so all that kind of research and analysis then culminates in and findings and the, the lawyers will use that and if it goes to trial we may even be asked to provide testimony as an expert witness. So that's kind of a little bit of a nutshell of what forensic engineering. So it's a little bit like CSI for buildings, is that? <laughs> yes, yes. Like for example, we had a project where there was this storage silo of fly ash, which I won't go into a big definition of what fly ash is used for, but it's an 80 foot diameter steel tank um, silo and it just collapsed and we had to figure out, I, I mean, I was young at the time when I started on that one, but I had to do all this research. I went to Lehigh's library because at that time the internet wasn't as vast as it is now. And I would pull research papers on hoop stress and how that's contained and and then I looked at the other engineers. All I had was his printout of his Excel sheet. I didn't have the actual Excel file. So I had to figure out how he got to all the different formulas in the, um, in the cell. And as, uh, as uh, Dr. J said, um, it was a big puzzle and I loved it <laughs> to try and figure out all the different things that went into that spreadsheet where I couldn't find they didn't have the answers behind the cells. They had to keep figuring out what he did. But while I still have you here, we just got a question popped into the chat box. And by the way, please use the chat oh, box to present your questions. But uh, Alexandra is wondering, how did you even get into forensic engineering? 
Um, I mean, most kindergartners don't say, when I grow up, I want to be a forensic engineer. <laughs> um, I was lucky, I guess. Um, I went to graduate school at Lehigh University, and I do, they have the Atlas facility up there. It was a big testing facility. So there's two in the nation, I believe. And um, they have the big Fritz um, five million pound machine, they call it a universal testing machine. And there's a lot of companies that come and rent out or the resources at the labs to test their stuff. And um, so I learned that it existed. There was a company called Wiss Janie Elsner that did a lot of work. And um, it just so happened that Dewey Engineering, this little local company in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, at, at the time where there was 20 employees, but the owner, Jerry Dewey, was very involved. He went to Manhattan College and he was involved in a lot of um, projects with lawyers and forensic engineering and they, I hopped on board. <laughs> wow. So let me turn to Lisa. Um, so Lisa is a business leader at Orisher Technologies, and she obviously has a very different kind of career tra trajectory. But um, yeah, I, I, I was hoping maybe you would just talk a little bit about you know you are a STEM uh, a STEM product in a sense. You are know, science, technology, engineering, and math. So how did you enter? into the STEM world, and were there any specific challenges that you experienced in that world that maybe were unique to you being a woman or you know a young girl when you started? Um, because it's not easy sometimes for people to break into the STEM, the STEM environment. So what was your experience? Yeah, thank you. And, and just thank you to everyone for organizing this event. It's really, really fabulous. And I'm hoping maybe next year we'll all be in person um, so we can actually meet each other in three dimension. Um, so a great question, and it's interesting um, with my fellow panelists so far, there's a Lehigh connection going on here. So um, I went to Lehigh University undergrad, um, so I do remember that facility, Annette, uh, as well <laughs> um, from Lehigh perspective, and I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer from Lehigh. And I guess, you know, I entered the STEM field um, because I really wanted to be a doctor. And so I started at Lehigh as pre-med in biology. And after my first year, I realized I really don't like biology. And, um, and I really liked chemistry a lot better. And then I realized, gee, it's really a long road to go become an MD. And I don't know that I can go that far in terms of the, the, the funding that we had from my family. So I said, you know what, I better switch into engineering so that when I graduate, I can get a job and then I can go to medical school later, you know, after I earn money and kind of save up. Um, so I became a chemical engineer just because I liked chemistry and I liked math and I thought, okay, that seems like an interesting career and an interesting choice. Um, it was hard. When I went to Lehigh, there was um, two thirds men, one third women. I think there was like four women in chemical engineering in my class, maybe, if I remember correctly. So I was one of few. Um, I graduated and I went into the chemical industry and I worked in plant environments. So manufacturing plants, I wore a hard hat for six years. Um, I was the only woman engineer in most of the facilities that I worked in. In one facility, I was the only woman, the first and only woman supervisor of hourly shift work employees and, and shift foremen and the like. So it was pretty much a trailblazing experience. Um, not easy at times, but I'll tell you what, you learn a lot. Um, and then I pivoted and I went actually to get an MBA. Um, after my MBA at UCLA, I ended up going into marketing and um, I worked actually in General Mills at cereals and marketing cereals. And then I came back to healthcare about 20 years ago because I felt I really wanted that sense of purpose that hope folks have talked about. And I also like the puzzle idea because I like to solve problems. So even though right now I work for Orishore Technologies, which is in Bethlehem, and we make diagnostic tests, um, and I'm leading a business at this point, right? So I don't get involved as much in the science anymore, but I have to tell you, I still am solving problems every single day. And, you know, if you like problem solving and you like, you know, thinking through things and, you know, 
in particular, I like helping people back to the whole doctor thing. Um, that's why I ended up back in healthcare because I felt like now I can make a difference by making tests. You know, we, we make tests for some of the world's worst diseases, HIV, hepatitis, Ebola, and now COVID-19. And I feel like every single test that goes out the door from our factory, which is literally in Bethlehem across from Lehigh, um, every single test is, is a person who can detect a disease that they might have, and then they can find a doctor and get care or isolate maybe if it's COVID-19 and protect other people from, from catching it. So I don't know, that's just a little bit about me. And I, I will say that um, it's better now as a female engineer. I think there's a lot more of us <laughs> out there. So uh, it's, it's a little different than perhaps when I did it, gosh, over 30 years ago. Um, but it was a very rewarding career. And I, I will leave you with the idea that an engineering or STEM background gives you a foundation that you can do just about anything with. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can run a business like I do. Um, so it just gives you an unlimited amount of potential as you move through your future. You know, you just reminded me of something. My, my grandmother was very important to me as a, as a mentor and as a champion and supporter. And, you know, when I was four, and I said, oh, I want to be a doctor um, when I grow up. But I, my grandma, I don't know if I can. It's so hard. You know, can girls be doctors? And my grandmother just looked me right in the eye and she said, you know what? You can be anything you want to be if you're willing to work hard enough. And that, that spirit has stayed with me my entire life. Whenever I have doubts, and I'm going to come back to this issue of doubts and giving up in a, in a minute, but I, I just really resonate with what you're saying. Like it, it's not always easy, but you just do it because you have a passion, you love the puzzle and the contribution that you're making. Yeah. So let me um, move to Victoria, who um, right now is in charge of maybe recruiting other diverse people with STEM backgrounds because she works in a, in a science-based company, but she's responsible for the human resources component of the company, which is where people get recruited and developed and supported so that they can be as successful as possible in their careers. And I, I understand, Victoria, that you have been a consistent and very visible champion of diversity broadly. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about that diversity of career, but also diversity of, you know, the wise crowd that you need to bring together to help solve problems um, and make better decisions when you have more diverse people, including racial and ethnic diversity, gender diversity, but also the unmeasured aspects of diversity. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie, and, and uh, greetings to everyone joining this evening. It's been a phenomenal evening thus far, starting with the uh, roundtable discussions and speaking with the students. So um, as, as Julie says, in my uh, current role, I do have a, a responsibility for ensuring that um, we as an organization place what we call diversity, inclusion, and belonging. We call it dibs. I got dibs, right? Uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, that we place it where it belongs at, on the agenda. And at, that's at the top, right? Because at the end of the day, all of these problems and puzzles that, that, uh, that uh, the prior panelists spoke of uh, that have to be solved on a daily basis, you have to have a myriad of talents and, and, and thought processes and everything if you're gonna come up with the best solution. And guess what? Some of those best solutions come from women, right? <laughs> so it, it's my responsibility as a leader of the organization to ensure that diversity, inclusion, belonging re, uh, is right up there with being profitable as a company, being safe as a company. Uh, and and uh, helping the the world tackle uh, the challenges of climate change. So um, I also come from a STEM background as well, and um, starting off as a chemical engineer and political scientist, and have had a myriad of, of uh, experiences over the course of my career ultimately leading me to this role where I have the pleasure of leading the company's uh, uh, people initiatives, but diversity, inclusion, and belonging have always been a passion of mine. Now, one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of for our organization is that diversity, inclusion, belonging isn't the responsibility of one person, though. 
So um, it's, uh, I feel very fortunate that we have an organization where all employees feel like they have ownership in the culture that we have, um, whether it's the CEO setting the, the agenda and saying, no, we need to work on this and being very public about it, or if it's you know the thousands of employees across the globe who participate in our employee resource groups that, uh, that are very active in helping drive uh, uh, the engagement of our diverse uh, population. So very proud of that. Um, one of our most uh, uh, powerful employee resource groups is our Women's Success Network. And it is a global uh, women's network where uh, uh, women engage each other from across the globe to share uh, career experiences, much like this forum this evening to share their career experiences, to, to, to have those frank and open and honest conversations. Um, and when you have uh, resource groups like that, then I think you continue to see women progress in, in uh, the corporate arena. Very proud that um, women in air products are leading in a multitude of ways. We occupy the C-suite, multiple women occupy the C-suite there are women who are developing technology to, to solve climate uh, challenges. There are women who are building operating facilities in the middle of the desert in, in air products. So I uh, love your grandmother's uh, adage, Julie, of, of uh, you can do whatever you want to do if you're willing to work hard at it. And, and I'm really proud that within air products, there are a lot of women working really hard and making a huge difference. Thank you, Victoria. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it is important to capture the, what you just said about these kinds of networks. Um, we kind of take networking for granted, people participate in social media, you have your own peer group of friends, et cetera, et cetera. But I have found in my life that, you know, cultivating a, a network of women, colleagues, friends, associates <coughs> is probably the most helpful thing for my career that I've ever experienced. Okay. Because there is something very special about the circle of women coming together and saying, it's, we're all in this together and here's what I learned and here's what I learned and sharing and collaborating are skills that are often particularly comfortable and part of kind of the culture of being a woman in our society. And to the extent that we can build from that and support each other. When I first went to CDC for my very first job before I was the director, I went to my first division director's meeting in my, in my smaller center and um, I sat down at the table. Well, first of all, I sat down with the women who were all sitting in chairs around the table because I thought that must be where the women sat. Mm -hmm. So I sat in one of those chairs and, and one of the women said, no, 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 you have to sit at the table. And so I moved to the table. And of course, at that time, I was the only woman at the table because all of the other um, leaders around that table happened to be men. And when I sat down at the table, the women around the room who were kind of the support staff stood and clapped. Mm. And I will never forget that because it was that powerful sense of women supporting each other and being a champion. So if one of us has a chance to take a step forward, then the rest of us can applaud, but also remember that the next time they're in a position to be sure that they are applauding the 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 person who gets an opportunity to be successful. Absolutely, so, absolutely. And what you're talking about, Julie, also is like what I call authentic networking. Oftentimes we say, oh, that person is, I'm connected to them on LinkedIn, therefore <laughs> we've networked. No, authentic networking, where you can actually have conversation and share each other's thoughts and questions and the things that you, the doubts, that's real networking. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that, Victoria. And, and so Kelly, we haven't um, heard from you yet. And I, um, one of the questions that's come forward, I think is perfect for you is people really are curious, like, 
what is a day in your work life really like? You know, you have this credential, you also have an MBA, so you know the science and you know the business side of things, but what do you actually do, you know, when you get up and go to work in the morning? What's a day in the life of Kelly Beaver? Absolutely, and, and some days I don't know, right? Some days I get to the day and I think, what did I do today? Um, no, but thank you, and, and I'll echo my fellow panelists, you know, thanks everybody for attending, this, is, this has been great. Um, and just honored to be here. And I will also make a couple of connections here. I am also a Lehigh grad. I'm an industrial engineer. Um, so, we'll, and I also have a, a very similar, I think, grandmother to, to you. Um, she used to always tell me when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that was just the end of it. So um, she also started every female sports team in Reading High School um, around our area. And she was a, she played in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. So she yeah. had, she was certainly a trailblazer and really, you know, led the way for me. So very fortunate to have that female role model for me from the get go. Um, so getting back to, I'll also, I'll, I'll jump into the puzzle theme as well. So um, I started my career, I do have the, um, an engineering background and I start, started as an engineer with UGI Utilities, which everybody is familiar, UGI Utilities, obviously a gas provider, you know, you, can go, you go, you build pipe, you put pipe in the ground. And that's what I did. Uh, but there's a whole network of pipelines upstream that they are transporting the gas to the utility. Um, and there's a whole virtual world and a puzzle to be put together every day on that network of pipelines. Um, so I, for the unregulated entity of UJ Corporation, and we essentially lease space on all of these pipelines and can transport gas from different regions. It could be the Gulf of Mexico, it can be Midwest, it can be Marcella Shale right in our backyard um, to various markets. Um, so we basically move gas all over the country to all different local distribution companies within the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast region. So every day, basically, we have a big puzzle to put together where we have customers demand that change based on weather, or it might be a production facility um, that might be changing their shifts. And we're estimating that on a daily basis. And then we're going out and we're acquiring the supplies. And then if there is additional space available on any of these assets that we have, we basically can optimize that and look for other changes in the marketplace to, to make money. Um, so it's, and when it gets very, very cold, it gets very exciting. Um, and <laughs> we as a company um, actually own some LNG storage, liquefied natural gas storage facilities that can be used on those peak days when it gets very cold to, to sell to customers when the prices get very, very high. And it becomes very critical that that puzzle works out and everything gets, all of the gas gets transported where it needs to be. And what's what I'm very fortunate to have had the experience is right now in kind of my group at UGI Energy Services deals with that virtual side. So logistically, basically putting in, you know, electronic nominations to say, I want to move gas from here to here. But I've also sat on the operational side as well throughout my career. So I've been in charge of the folks that actually turn the, turn the, turn the regulators on and off and make sure that the gas is flowing and open the valves and close the valves and are monitoring the systems. So being able to see both that virtual side and understanding the physical side of it because of my STEM background and because of my career opportunities is, is a very rare thing. And it, it has definitely helped me to provide a different perspective. And like Victoria was talking about diversity of thought, um, that to me is very important when you, when you talk about the diversity initiatives, it's not just a formula. There really is a lot to it. It's, it's gender, it's, it's race, it's background, it's th thought, like you said, like thought process. Um, because I, Because of what I do, we're not all engineers. Um, and I, I can say that a lot of times I think like engineers, so they're a little easier for me to, to figure out. Um, but having kind of that group of accountants and business majors and this and this, it makes it so much easier to get through problems and just brings a completely different perspective and you just get a better solution. Thank you for that. So we do have some uh, questions in the chat now that everyone's kind of had a chance to 
give a bit of a perspective. I mean, we could talk all night. I'm afraid that probably isn't going to be allowed, but um, I'm just gonna ask maybe Jay, Elsa, and Annette to address this first question sort of in a lightning round kind of way, and then I'll try to get through more of the questions that are showing up. So the first question that a number of students are interested in is, um, what is your advice for high schoolers when they're trying to narrow down their career interests in STEM? In other words, STEM is a big, broad issue, and you know, lots of us were interested in science, but how do you translate your interest in, in, in the STEM areas into something that really drives you toward your career goals and, and you know, narrow the scope of what you're aiming for so that you have a chance of actually moving progressively in that direction? So Jay, why don't we just start with you and we can go to Elsa and Annette to follow. That is a fantastic question. Um, something that I would probably advise is just trying to do as, just trying out different things as much as possible. And this is something that I kind of said a lot during the, the group discussions before this, but um, finding out if there are summer internships that you can do, or if you have an interest in research, since that's what I currently do, um, you can actually reach out to some labs and see if they'd be willing to let you work or shadow in the lab the same way that you can shadow a doctor you can shadow researchers and see what their day-to-day -day is like to see if it's something interesting because it may be that you have an interest in the topic but then once you see what that job actually does it could be super boring to you <laughs> if i wanted to describe my job in the most unsatisfying way i move small amounts of liquids to different tubes. Sometimes I heat them up. Sometimes I freeze them. <laughs> sometimes I spin them really fast. That is physically what I'm doing, but that doesn't sound as cool compared to like, I'm trying to figure out like how cancer works, you know? So it's like the, the topic is so much more interesting than what I'm physically doing that if you just try all of these different internships or programs or just talking to people and asking them what they do, you can start to see the things like, no, nah, that's kind of boring. I don't want to do it. Or that's really interesting. Tell me more. And then just kind of follow where you start to light up when you hear things. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I spent some time in the lab and I know exactly what you mean about pipetting, <laughs> spinning, <laughs> doing the, 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 the work that actually makes science happen is not always glamorous, but thank you for that. So Elsa, do you have an answer to this question? Yeah, so maybe building on what Jay just said, that yeah, definitely, um, yeah, the day to day of what you do in a science or engineering based career, yeah, if you describe a particular day, it could sound super boring and mm, I'm really interested in this. Um, you know, but I'd say get as many different experiences as you can. And you know, from those experiences, what really motivates you? You know, is there something that you find much more interesting and that you're much more passionate about? Um, and and don't be afraid to change directions uh, because you know, in high school, finishing high school. Um, I don't think it's realistic to expect that you're going to know what direction your career is going to take into the future. And those first few years in college should be where you can explore and explore different paths, different disciplines, different avenues. And don't be afraid to do that um, because that'll give you a greater breadth of experience coupled with internships or research experiences where you can get a better sense of what you would like to follow. What do you want your path to be? And the other piece of it is you may change it. You know, you follow a path through college that also doesn't define you for your career. Uh, because 
you will change directions. You will be doing something different at various points in your during your career. And you know, I, it's, those changes. <laughs> I love what you just said, Elsa, because, you know, I just think of my own life, like, I went, so I was four, I wanted to be a doctor, but I grew up in a town of 800 people in the middle of South Dakota, and to me, being a doctor meant that I would have a small practice, and when children came in to get their annual, you know, shots, mm -hmm. they would get gum if they behave themselves. Yeah. That was kind of my understanding of what a doctor did, give shots, give gum. Um, but of course, you know, as I progressed, I ended up um, in San Francisco for my training in medicine, right when the AIDS epidemic was bursting open. And I suddenly found myself moving into the infectious disease world, not ever, ever thinking about that as a career, but it became my career. And then suddenly I found myself at the CDC and you know that was certainly not how I thought four years old I was going to live my career. And then when that ended, like all of a sudden I found myself running a vaccine business in a pharmaceutical company, and now I'm doing something even different. So the point is that you know it's like putting tools in your toolbox. You know if you have an opportunity to have an interesting, productive experience, especially when you're early in your career, you should always say yes because the worst thing that could happen is you'll just learn something and you'll you'll gain an experience that you put in your toolbox. You never know down the road when that's going to come in handy. It probably will, but there's no harm, no fall, and you can always change and flex as you go forward. Right. So I think right. that, that idea of you don't have to make a permanent decision. You can e evolve and change as you go forward. So, um, Annette, do you want to add something to this conversation about, um, you know, the, the, the whole issue of narrowing the playing field and when and how you went about it? Have we lost Annette? Hmm. Annette, do you have your microphone on? I don't see her, so why don't we um, hope that she rejoins us? <laughs> In the meantime, I'll move on to the, um, the next biggest question, um, which is a, a really kind of a sobering question. Um, and that question is, has there been a time when you really felt like giving up and how did you overcome it? So Lisa and Kelly, why don't we start with you? And Victoria, if you want to chime in on this as well, I think this is a really you know, it's an important question because I'm sure each one of us have had some moments of doubt. Yeah, I guess I start. Um, this is a tough one in some ways and sobering would be the word, but it's a good one. And I would say absolutely. There's been many, many times in my career I felt like giving up, um, you know, where challenges just seemed too big and, and maybe I didn't feel like I was prepared for the job and, oh my gosh, you know, um, Sometimes your personal life gets in, in the middle of all of this as well. Um, so I have a teenage daughter. She's a senior. Um, she is going to be going into to a STEM field. She wants to major in physics. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And I have a son who's a freshman in high school, also interested in math. Um, so I don't know. I guess to chip off the old block. But I'll tell you what, when they were teenagers, like middle school, high school ages, young, a little bit younger than now, it was pretty rough. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, and then at the same time, you know, my career was, was challenging as well. Um, and there was times where, you know, it just, it just seemed overwhelming. Like there's just so much between being a mom and being a success in my career. Um, you know, my husband was also working at the time and he had a pretty sizable career as well. I traveled 50% of my time globally for eight years. So I went somewhere in the world every single month for a week for eight years and just add all that up. And it's, it's, it's very, very challenging. But I think what got me through it was I actually really do enjoy what I do and, you know, leading a business in healthcare. And so even on the t times when it just felt overwhelming and tough, I, I kind of kept that in mind. Like I actually really do like this work and it, it, <laughs> it keeps me going. Right. I think if you find that passion, that, that, so your job doesn't feel like a job. You know, it actually feels like something very interesting that you like to do and you like the people you're working with. That helps a whole lot. 
And so that helps you get through, you know, the different challenges you might face where like a new product doesn't go well or things take longer than they're supposed to. Um, you miss your sales numbers if you're leading a business. Those sorts of things can can really be disheartening. But I think in the end, if you if you find what you enjoy and work doesn't feel like work, you'll power through it would be my advice. So, um, Victoria, I'm going to jump over to you to answer the same question. And then, Kelly, I'm going to present a new question to you because we're getting a few more questions here. So I want to try to get, get a, a few more things on the table. So, uh, Victoria, have you ever felt like giving up? I, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't use the, the term giving up, but I absolutely have felt challenged, right? challenged it with whether what I'm doing is is what I really should be doing that question or uh, challenged with um, you know making some of those solving the puzzles go back to the puzzles right Chal uh, solving the puzzles what I found during those moments what was most valuable to me is to have someone to talk to about it right have a mentor who you can can sit with and, and talk about, well, I, I really don't know. This is what I'm experiencing. What have you seen? Are, are there any other resources that you could connect me with who may have experienced the same thing, right? So uh, for me, it's not been giving up. It's been uh, uh, experiences of being at different forks in a road, right? And not knowing whether to go right or left. And uh, um, the team at Air Products has, has heard me say often that sometimes a mentor can be a really good GPS when you're, <laughs> on, when you're on a journey, right? So, uh, and, and I don't consider any of those turns that I made, I don't consider them to be failure. I consider them to be, I made an affirmative choice to do something else. That's a great, that's a great philosophy. So, so Kelly, um, did you ever worry that you made the wrong decision? That maybe you weren't doing the thing that was the right thing for you? Absolutely. <laughs> That's definitely, you know, and kind of along the same lines, I think, of the last question. You know, you kind of, you're always making a decision with the best information that you have at that time. And it's, it's very easy to say hindsight. In hindsight, I should have. In hindsight, I should have. Well, Hindsight's 2020. So at the point in time, you just have to make sure that you're you are making the correct de decision with all of the variables and the inputs that are important to you. Um, and and I don't know that you you can know that it's the thing for you because of everything that we've talked about. You know, enjoying your work. If you think about the, uh, the basics of what you're doing, the day to day, like Dr. J talked about. I mean, for me, a lot of times it's meetings or I'm in a spreadsheet or I'm doing that. Doesn't sound fun at all. Um, so, you know, going through that, you, you, that's not the way you, sometimes you just kind of have to take a little bit of a leap of faith and then, and you find your tribe, right? That's, that's the biggest thing is you find your tribe and you, you get, is it the mentor? It's the team of people. It's, it's those folks that can lift you up and, and support you when you have those moments of doubt. Oh gosh, did I get in over my head? Did I make the wrong decision? Do I really have time for this right now? Um, you know, you have ups and downs all the time, you know, and, and talking about Lisa, I'll say, you're making me a little nervous because I have a two year old and I feel like I'm going to give up every day. And you're saying it's worse when he's teens and preteens. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely a journey and there's ups and downs and you've got to, you've got to find those people that can pull you through. Thank you. So Jay, here's a question. Um, I'll start with you. Have, have you, do you feel like you had to work harder to defend your seat at the table? as a researcher or as a scientist? Um, and do you have any advice for women as they work through kind of the gender issues in the workplace? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, definitely sometimes. And ironically, I think the pandemic has helped a little bit with that because mm -hmm. um, a lot of things that, that my field does like for giving presentations or, or conferences and you're hearing the research that these really big name scientists are doing and you want to have discussions, you want to be able to network with them. It was always very difficult for me to be able to ask questions to make myself known or sometimes, especially when I was in grad school, 
I had a, a male lab mate that would often exclude me. So it, I was the only female grad student for a while. I was the very first grad student. So it was me and three other guys as, as grad students. And the others didn't do this, but I noticed that he would often, after there was a seminar, talk to the others about their ideas and not really include me in any of those discussions. Or he was very big about sort of interrupting the things that I was saying. And, <laughs> and that is hard to deal with when, you know, it's constantly happening to you or you notice that it's not happening to anyone else. And kind of a little bit with what we were saying before about having, you know, finding your people and having others that you can talk to about it to even just get a quick check of like, this isn't me, right? Like to have someone validate your feelings and your thoughts is very helpful. And then after that, sometimes it's just practice and the only way is through. So now I'm a lot better that when people start to interrupt me, I interrupt back and say, I'm not finished yet. Like, yeah, good for you. And That's really until hard. <laughs> until I'm done talking. So I, I try to not do it rudely, but it's more just no, I want to hear what you're thinking, but I haven't finished my thought yet. I might answer your question in the process. And that's something that it was only through, you know, experience and feeling my heart start to beat really fast as like, I'm thinking about interrupting back that I've just gotten used to it over time. You know, one thing I always encourage um, the people that I mentor or coach, but in a, it can happen with girls and women in all stages of their careers is that, um, you know, create allies in the room. So if you and I are in a room together and you're trying to speak, I can say, um, excuse me, but Jay, I, I wanted to hear what Jay was saying. Um, I, Jay, can you please continue? Or, you know, to validate each other, you know, as Jay was saying, this is a really important thing for our company to pay attention to. So you can mutually reinforce as men do naturally in, in, in many settings, but we, we can create a stronger network amongst ourselves to really make sure that our voices get heard. And I do see that Annette has come back on. So I'm going to give her, we have approximately two minutes, lightning rounds, really fast answers. But Annette, if you could give one piece of advice to yourself when you were young, what would it be? And if we have time, I'll try to get everyone to answer that question really quickly. So advice to your young self. Um, stay confident. I, think, I love uh, it. I had it more when I was younger, I think. And I'd like to have a little so bit. Hang of on to now. that confidence. How about you, Lisa? Never stop learning. That's been ah. my key phrase. Love it. Kelly. Five. <laughs> I got to write that one down. <laughs> Victoria, advice to your young self. Give it a try. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> there you go. Elsa. You're on mute. Can we unmute uh, Elsa? Yeah, yeah, I got unmuted. Uh, I say combination of don't be afraid to try, but don't be afraid to speak up yeah. and say okay. what's on your mind. And Jay, you get the last word. I would probably say miss 100% of the shots you don't take. There you go. Okay, well, what a wonderful panel. I feel like I want to meet all of you in person quickly. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing, and thank you to our audience. And Lynn, I'll turn it back to you because I know we're on a time clock here, but what a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And I can only echo what a privilege. Wow. You know, each year I leave the Wise Forum so inspired by the panel and wonder who we can do the following year possibly deliver a program of similar caliber on my wildest dreams. I want to thank each of the panelists for sharing their expertise and insights with us. And thank you again to all the sponsors, the Wise Advisory Council, my staff who has done an incredible job in putting this whole program together, and all of you for being here tonight. Tonight was a clear example of how the Da Vinci Science Center fulfills its mission to bring science to life and lives to science. More than that, it was about connection and empowerment. I know I felt that. 
and I hope all of you got as much out of the program as I did. Before we say good night, I would like to share a little bit more information on the WISE initiative at the Da Vinci Science Center. We have a number of programs and events throughout the year to introduce students to STEM careers and to provide STEM professionals with the opportunity to network and support each other. In addition to the annual WISE Forum and dinner, we didn't have the dinner part tonight, we host Women in STEM Career Connection Field Trip Days, a STEAM Girls After School Club, Girl Scout Day and Camp-In programs, and evening network events for practicing STEM professionals. As I said earlier, our WISE Advisory Council is planning additional opportunities for all of us, and we'll learn more in the coming months. You can learn more about the WISE initiative overall Lynn, you you went uh, you went off mute. You're back on. Am I really? Okay, good. Now you're on again. Yeah. Okay, good. I don't know how that happened. I didn't do anything. All right. Anyway, um, and of course, you know, if you'd like to support us financially, you can do that through our website. But do check out our our website for wise programs and also follow us on LinkedIn. Have a good night, and I really hope as Julie and everyone else has said that we can see each other in person sometime soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye Thank now. You.